Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to all our online students uh, and welcome to our in person students. Also, welcome to our e learning students who will be listening to this lecture later on. Um, last Wednesday, we did not have class, so we just had class last Tuesday. Uh, we began studying chapter six, so please turn uh, in your Bibles to chapter six, or you can have your notes, it's there. So in chapter six, we are basically seeing that, you know, Paul is, address is addressing the uh, basic problem or the main issue of, what is the main issue? Sin, yes. And he has two main questions. What is the first question? Shall we continue to sin? Verse one. And the second question is in verse 15, yes. What is the second question? Yeah, shall we continue to sin because we are, uh, you know, uh, under grace and not under the law, okay? And then what does, how does he respond to the question one, the first question, shall we qu continue to sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. Why? Why not? How is a person who is dead to sin, you know, or a person who is dead to sin cannot sin and then he goes on to talk about how we are baptized into christ we are baptized into his um, death okay his death his burial his resurrection his ascension and him being seated at the right hand of the father so this is a powerful expression a powerful proclamation of the spiritual truths of our spiritual identification so if you want to know our spiritual identification, we have to read um, um, uh, Romans chapter 5 and chapter uh, 6, okay? And here in chapter 5, he's basically, or 6, he's talking about a spiritual truth of the identification with Christ's death, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension, and him being seated at the right hand of Jesus Christ. Okay. So we looked at the first few verses. We came right up to verse 5. So we'll continue our study from verse 5 onwards. But before that, we'll pause for a word of prayer. So can one of you please lead us in prayer, please? Anyone? Go ahead, Chira, pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you in the mighty name of Jesus. We thank you so much for this wonderful moment and this wonderful day, my Father God. We thank you for setting up, my Father God, as we're going to study from your word, my Father God. Give us more understanding from your word so that, Lord, we'll not be, be a hearers, but, Lord, help us to be a doers, my Father God. Lord, give us your revelations through me, my Father God. Thank you so much, my Father God. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 So Romans chapter 6, verse 5. Can one of you read that, please? Romans 6, verse 5. For if we have been untend together. United together. Oh, united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrections. Amen. So he's saying, if we died with Christ, okay, here it says, we will also be raised with him. So this whole thing of death, of burial, of resurrection, we are identifying with Christ. Now, when we're talking about identifying with Christ, we're talking about spiritually identifying with him. So you, you can ask, hey, how did I die with Christ? How can, how was I I'm buried? How am I resurrected? It's, we're all talking about it in a very spiritual uh, sense. It has a very spiritual uh, significance. And that is why we're talking about it as our spiritual identification okay so we are united together means we identify with he says here we have been united together means we have been we identify with christ which means when christ died we also died when he was buried we were also buried okay we look at it in more detail how we are dead, we are buried, we are resurrected, ascended. Uh, we'll just look at it in a little bit. So in Romans 6, he does not mention uh, the ascending part, right? He does not talk about ascending. He just talks about the death, the burial, the resurrection, 
doesn't talk about the ascending, but why am I talking about even the ascending and him being seated at the right hand of God the Father? Is we know this from Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6. So can somebody please read Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6, please? And raises raises up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Yeah, it says here, and raised us up together and made us. So who is the us? Yes, raised us believers. Okay, made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So this verse also says that we are together united with Christ in his ascension and him being seated at the right hand of the Father. Okay, so when Christ ascended, we also ascended. When he ascended, it means spiritually we're ascended with him, which means that though the systems of this world no longer have a control over the believer. So what does it mean that we have been ascended with Christ? What does it mean spiritually? It means that, you know, how do we identify with that spiritual truth? It is that it means that the systems of this world has no longer control over a believer. That means we have authority over everything uh, that, uh, you know, used to suppress us, depress us, oppress us. We have authority over every work of the enemy, uh, every scheme of the enemy. We have um, uh, authority, lordship, because we are people who ascended with him and we're seated with him at the right, and we're seated at the right hand of the father along with Jesus. Okay. So, why do we have this authority? Because as believers, we are taken out of the world, okay? Spiritually speaking. Spiritually speaking, we are no longer part of this world because we belong to the kingdom of God, okay? So look at what Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 and 2 says. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 and 2. And you, he made alive, who were dead in... Transpass and trespasses. trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the curse of the world, according to the prince of the power of the year, the spirit who now walks in the son of disobedience. So this verse tells us that there is a system of disobedience and rebellion at work in the world okay so people of this world are under the prince of the power of the air and who is it referring to satan yes and it's also referring to a system of evil a system of disobedience and a system of rebellion okay so you and i are no longer under this influence of evil the system of evil the system of disobedience and the system of rebellion why because we have been raised up with christ and we are seated with him at the right hand which gives us authority and power over all of these systems of evil of disobedience of and of rebellion okay so while we live in this world where there is spiritual darkness, where there is rebellion, there is evil, there is every form of moral degradation, there is corruption, but that should not influence us and that should not dominate us or that should not overpower us. Why? Why should the system of this world not dominate us and overpower us? We are dead to it. We have been raised up with Christ Jesus, okay? So we are raised up with Christ Jesus spiritually, which means we have been taken out of this influence of this uh, system of this world. And hence, we dominate this world. We dominate evil. We dominate the corruption. We dominate the evil decay or the immoral decay or the moral decay that is there in this world world and we don't let darkness we don't let evil we don't let the corruption of this world dominate us okay because we are the light and light is more powerful than the darkness right now most believers don't know this 
truth and hence they are constantly or sometimes we are also constantly living under this dominion of darkness right why because we are uh, we don't know this truth we're negligent of this truth so look at what ephesians chapter 2 says it says raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in christ jesus amen so we are united with christ or we identify with his exaltation so when christ was made to sit at the right hand of the father you and i are also made to sit at the right hand of the father which means we are placed in a place of authority and the place of the highest and the place of the greatest authority so the place that god has placed you and me is a place of the highest and the greatest authority there's no higher greater uh, higher or greater or bigger placing than what he has already placed you and me and we are seated together with christ in this place of authority in this place of dominion in the spiritual realm so what does that mean it means that even as we are spiritually seated in a place of the highest authority and dom dominion seated united with jesus at the right hand of the father we are in a place where we can operate on this earth out of a place of authority right so on this earth we operate out of a place of authority so when we confront demonic forces when we confront demonic opposition or oppression or when we confront the challenges the situations the trials and the temptations in our life how do we operate not out of fear not that the devil is overpowering us not that the devil has done all of these things and we're scared or not that we uh, run to people for you know of course it's important that we ask for prayer support yes uh, we ask people to pray but we need to confront these demonic forces okay these challenges in life and how can we confront that because we are operating from a place of dominion and authority okay so why can we operate in dominion and authority because of the place where we are seated we are seated at the right hand of the father in the heavenly place so what does the spiritual identity bring for us it enables us and empowers us that hey we can speak to every situation every circumstance whether it is regarding your spouse your marriage your relationship your family your children your finances uh, your job your careers you know there's strife at home there's no peace at home um, uh, you don't see breakthroughs uh, you don't see things happening in your life what do you do you exercise your god-given authority you speak because you're speaking from the highest place of authority that god has seated you or placed you and you need to remember that we are not striving for authority we're not saying god give me authority over this thing that is happening you're already seated in a place of authority what you need to do is you have to exert your authority okay so you need to we need to learn how to exert our authority what are the weapons of warfare that we need to use god has already given us the weapons for warfare right every weapon that we have he has given us he's given us the word of god he's given us prayer he's given us his name he's given us uh, uh, the worship his uh, you know worship and uh, praise he's given us every weapon that we need to fight the enemy but what do we do we need to exert our authority that means we don't stop we don't step down we don't give up till we see the breakthrough till we receive answers okay so many believers think that they must strive for authority so you know what they do they fast and they do this and they do that well these are spiritual uh, disciplines which is very very important i'm not against that and i'm not saying that we shouldn't do these disciplines these are important disciplines that keeps uh, you know ourselves in good spiritual condition so yes we need to fast and spend extended times in prayer and worship and and all of those things but 
what we need to do is we need to see ourselves already fit, already enabled, already strengthened, that we don't strive for authority, that we are already exerting our authority. So sometimes if you don't know how to fight the enemy, even after God has given you all the weapons, you can ask him, God, what do I need to do, right? Like in the case of David, uh, remember David, he went to uh, the Philistines had come to fight against him. So David inquired of God. And what did God say? Go and fight the Philistines and I will hand them over to you. So he goes and fights the Philistines. And as God said, he won the battle. But after a few days, the Philistines came against David in that same place, right? And this time, David was not acting overconfident. He said, okay, already I prayed. No, God said, I'm going to give you. So I'll just go and fight them. This time he goes back and asks, inquires of God. He says, God, what should I do? This time God gives him another strategy, right? He gives him a strategy, but then he also involves the heavenly host of armies to fight for David in this war. So sometimes, yes, we have, give, we have been given the weapons of warfare that we need to fight and engage against our enemy, but sometimes we can also ask God, God, what are the weapons that I need to use? And God will give us the um, strategies, okay? So we exert the authority that God has given to us by faith. Uh, you know, we exert it in faith in God and also using the word of God and using the power that is in the name of Jesus, okay? So he says that in all of these five stages, what are the five stages? Jesus' death, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension and being seated, we are united with Christ Jesus. Okay, We identify with Christ Jesus. So what does that mean for you and I today? Okay, Or how does it affect our lives today? How does the spiritual truth, how does the spiritual identification, you know, uh, 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 how do we, how does it affect our life today? And what does it mean to us today? That is what Paul is going on to explain. Okay. So remember what he started out with? He started out with the question, shall we continue to live in sin? And he says, you know, we are dead to sin. And now he's going on to explain how this happens. How are we dead to sin? He's going on to explain how this happens. And in order to explain this, he's introduced this truth of being united together with Christ in all of the five uh, stages that I mentioned. And he's going to explain to us in a bit or in a little while, you know, what he's mentioned there, how this affects us from being free from sin. Okay. So having helped us, Paul, having helped us to understand the truth of our spiritual identification in Romans chapter 5 and Romans chapter 6, now he goes on to say what to do with it. Okay, What are we supposed to do with it? How do we live it out? Okay, So the primary interest in Paul dealing with this issue of sin is how do we live this truth? Right. So why is he talking about sin is basically he's going on to reiterate or going on to explain or going on to tell us, you know, how we live this truth with respect to the aspect of sin. How do we live the truth of our spiritual identification in respect to the aspect of sin? OK, and that is his primary focus. So we identify with Christ. But how can we live in holiness? People can ask that question. Hey, Paul, you're telling us we're dead to sin. Good. Okay. You're saying that this is our spiritual identification. Very good. But look at my life. I'm still not able to overcome sin. How am I able to live a holy life? So that is the primary focus. And that is where he's getting to. And that is where he's taking us to. So the, the latter part of Romans chapter 6, Romans chapter 7, Romans 8, he's answering that question. Hey, you're saying we're dead to skin, but how can we overcome sin? How can we live a holy life? So we are in Christ. We identify with him. Now, how do we become holy? How do we overcome sin? Okay, so we'll move on. Any questions so far? Any questions? 
Okay, if there are no questions, we'll move on to verses six and seven. So can somebody please read uh, six and seven? Somebody please read verses six and seven, please. Thank you. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should not longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Amen. So in verse 6, you know, this verse begins with knowing this. Okay, so why is Paul writing or saying here, knowing this? Because he knows that many believers don't know this basic truth. They know all this basic truth, hey, that we are dead to sin. They don't know the basic truth that, hey, we have the spiritual identification. They don't know this truth that, hey, we can live in holiness, right? So this is something that we must know. And without knowing or having, you know, revelation of the spiritual understanding of this truth, we will not be able to walk in it, okay? So here he's talking in this verses about the old man versus the new man. So what is the old man referring to? Huh? Our old sinful nature, our unsaved human spirit. Okay. So how did the old man come to us? Through Adam. Yes. And the new man comes through us through Jesus. Yes. So when we say Jesus was the last Adam, we understand it because in Jesus, the old man comes to an end. Amen. Because it says, in Christ, we are a new creation. And in Christ, the new man is made in true or utter holiness and righteousness. Okay. So in contrast, the new man is referring to the divine nature that is in us. The old man has what kind of a nature? The sinful nature, the new man is referring to the divine nature that is in us, which is created in the image of God, image of God in true righteousness and holiness. Now the old man is the old sinful nature, the old nature or the old inclination to sin. Okay. Now what happened to the old man? What does Paul say? It is crucified. Crucified with whom? With Christ, with Jesus. So when Christ was crucified, you and I are also crucified. That is what means. It means spiritually that when we are born again, our old man is crucified. Our old man is dead. That is how we identify with Christ's death on the cross spiritually. Okay. So the part of us was crucified. Which part of us was crucified? The old man was crucified. The old man was crucified. The old man was put to death. It was the end of it and we are no, it's no longer alive. So as believers, you know, who have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, you and I no longer have the old man, but we have the new man which comes through whom? Jesus. So there's no longer the old sinful nature in our spirit man. Amen. Because we are made new in our spirit man. We don't have the whole nature in our spirit. The mind has to be made new. Right? The mind has to be made new. It has to think differently. It has to have the renewed mind. It has to take on the thoughts and the ways and the patterns of God. Okay? And hence we need to have the mind of Christ. And the body... Uh, you know, so we, when we have a different mind, we can think differently. We can think like Christ. And the body has to be crucified, right? That's why Paul talks about crucifying the desires of the flesh constantly, right? So why? Why should we crucify the flesh? If the old sinful nature is dead, in which part of you? In the spirit, okay? And we said the mind has to be renewed, made new to think differently. And we're saying the body has to be crucified. So I'm saying why should the body be crucified? It's still 
Because our body still likes to, desires to behave like the old man, right? Our spirit wants to operate in the new man, but our body desires to sometimes work out like the old man, to give in to the desires of the flesh and so the mind. That is why Paul says we have to constantly work out our salvation with fear and trembling. You know, we have to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. We have to crucify the flesh. And that is why even Jesus says that we need to take up our cross every day and follow him. What does it mean? That means crucifying the deeds, the desires, the appetites of the flesh. Okay. So, uh, so the, the mind has to be retrained to live like the new man right the body has to be retrained to be to live like the new man which paul is going to explain in the rest of the verses in this chapter in romans chapter 6 but and we need to understand that in our spirit there is no longer the old man but the new man okay did we read verse 6 as well yeah we read okay so we look at verse 6 Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. So verse 6 says that the body of sin, what does it mean the body of sin? Body of sin represents the sum totality of sin. Okay, the body of sin means the sum totality of sin. So the body is spoken in different ways in the New Testament. It refers to the physical body in some places. It refers to the body of Christ that represents all the believers as one body. Or it also represents the sum totality of something. Like here, the body of sin represents the sum totality of sin. Yeah, the sum totality of sin. The you know, body of sin. In some places, it refers to the body of Christ, that is the church. In some the uh, f places, it refers to the body, it's talking about our physical body. But some places, when it's talking about, you can also talk about a sum totality of something. Okay, so here's, it's representing the sum totality of sin. Okay, or the full measure of something, the full measure of sin. So that is the way it is used here. And it says that the body of sin might be done away with. That means the sum totality of sin is done away with. Means the sum totality of sin has to be gotten rid of so that we are no longer slaves of sin. So this verse 6 is powerful. Okay, This truth that as believers we are no longer slaves of sin. Amen. So we need to keep that in our heart and in our mind. Hey, I'm no longer a slave of sin. Why am I no longer a slave of sin? Because the old man is crucified. And also the sum totality of sin is taken out of my life. So when you and I died with Christ on the cross, now I'm going back to the spiritual truth of identification that we are dead, we died with Christ on the cross. So what does it mean? This is what has happened. Our old man was crucified. The sum totality of sin was taken out of our life. So now you understand how we spiritually identify with Jesus is dead on the cross. So when we're talking about, hey, we are dead to Christ on the cross, we are basically saying, hey, our old man is crucified on the cross. Okay, and the sum totality of sin was taken out of our life. Okay, and also as no longer as believers, we are slaves of sin. Why? Because the sum totality of sin has been done away with. Amen. So he says in verse 7 of the same chapter, for he who has died has been freed from sin. Okay, it says he who has died has been freed from sin. Now think of this in the natural. For example, a drunkard man, a man who always drinks and he's dead. Okay. Now um, the Bible says he who is dead is free from sin. 
right so now <laughs> around the coffin of this dead man if you keep all the expensive the best alcohol will he be able to get up and drink no <laughs> he won't be able to get up and drink why because he is dead right so what paul is saying in verses 6 and 7 he's saying is that the old man is dead the sum totality of sin that is controlling us is in our bodies is also dead therefore he says we are free from sin and all this took place on the cross so when christ died on the cross we also died with him our old man was crucified and the power of sin over our lives was broken so he's saying because of that today we can live free from sin yes it happened 2000 years back but today since you and i identify with him spiritually and what he has done with us on the cross with what happened 2000 years back with him this truth that we are dead to sin in christ that we are crucified in christ and the power of sin in our life is no longer applicable is broken is real okay so it comes to us spiritually are you all able to understand yes okay so that is how we can say we are dead to sin because we are crucified with christ so uh, this comes to us spiritually so this is a spiritual truth and what do we do you and i have to walk and we have to believe we have to walk and we have to manifest and live in this spiritual truth okay so today you and i can say that hey my old man is crucified with christ the body of sin has been destroyed the power of sin has been destroyed over my body and i'm no longer a slave of sin okay i'm dead to sin i'm free from sin you can say this today because this is spiritually ours in christ jesus amen okay the devil may want us to think that we are still subject to these things the devil can say hey you're listening to her but how can you be dead to sin look at the number of sins in your life how can you say you're free from sin you're not even able to you know uh you know um uh, control your anger or control the words that come out of your uh, mouth but you know the devil wants us does not want us to know these truths live these truths and believe these truths but you know even as we are seeing these truths these are very powerful truths you know if we can know these truths and believe these truths then we can resist what the devil is doing in our lives what he's putting on the believer and um uh when he says hey it's okay to sin it's okay to tell a lie it's okay to cheat it's okay to copy it's okay to do this and that but what you need to say is hey this is not my spiritual identification right this is not who i am i am dead to sin i can't do it just like we need to remember that the the drunkard who's lying on that coffin and keep all the expensive uh, alcohol is not able to get up and drink anything so you're saying i'm dead to sin i can't do that i can't tell that lie <clears throat> sorry i can't tell that lie i can't gossip i can't uh, backbite i can't use bad words i can't think this filthy thoughts all of these things should work and that is how we can live in holiness all of you with me able to understand yes uh, any questions so far any questions okay if not we will move to verses 8 to 10 so can somebody read verses 8 to 10 where paul talks about that we are dead and alive once for all yes verse 8 now if we died with christ we believe that we shall also live with him with him knowing that christ have been raised from the dead dies no more death no longer has dominion over him for the death that he died he died to sin once for all but the life that he lives he lives to god amen so was uh, was eight says that christ died and died and he rose again he lives right so the uh, the story does not just end with crucifixion okay so if we believe that we have been united together 
with Christ in his death. Uh, and he has already mentioned about this in verses 4 and 5. And if we believe that we have been united together with him in his burial, and also if we believe that we are united together with him in his resurrection, and that we live with him, Paul says the rest of it is also true. Okay. What is the rest also that is true? That, with, that when Christ was raised up from the dead, death has had no longer any control over him. Okay. So what is, how do we identify with Christ's resurrection? Is that the same way the past things of our life has no longer any control, any power over our lives. Okay. We are dead to sin. Okay. But we are also resurrected. It means that when we are resurrected, you know, that none of these things have any control over our lives. None of the past things that uh, was there, you know, we just put it behind. It no longer has any control over our lives. Okay. So what does this mean? You know, remember in verse 4, he says, we know that just as Christ was raised back uh, to life from the dead by the glory of the Father, we also walk in newness of life. The same chapter I'm uh, reading verse 4 where it says, we know that just as Christ was raised back to life by the glory of the Father, we also walk in newness of life. So to be resurrected with Christ means we are raised to walk in newness of life. Amen. We are resurrected in Christ spiritually means we are raised to walk in the newness of life. The new life, the new way, the new nature of God that will be seen uh, in and through us. So when Christ was buried, we were also buried. What does it mean? It means an end to the old ways, the old patterns. The old ways, the old patterns, the old things in our life has no longer any claim and power over our lives. Okay. So if sometimes you find yourself going and in, walking in, back into your past, you will say, hey, that's my past that has no longer any claim, no longer any power, no longer any authority. Yes, people have spoken things over your life. You've maybe faced abuse, uh, gone through various situations in your life, but you're saying, hey, in Christ, I'm a new creation. The old has no longer any past. You know, Satan always reminds us of our Past. He wants us to live in past, in the guilt, in the brokenness, in the pain, in what happened, see what has happened to you, what God has done, he's not done anything, and blah, blah. You know, we can live in the past, but we can miss out on the future or the present, what God is working and showing, or the move of God in our lives. You know, there is a saying, whenever Satan reminds you of the past, remind him of his future, right? Okay, whenever Satan reminds you of the past, remind them of his future. Okay, so, um, so when Christ was buried, we were also buried with him, which means the old does not have any claims over our lives. So the power of sin, the old ways of the old man has no longer any um, influence, power, authority over our lives. Now, just to give you an example, a man with a huge debt, Okay, he uh, has a huge debt. He's borrowed a lot of money and he dies and he's buried. Now, can the person, all the people who is borrowed from go and <laughs> try to tell him over his grave, hey, give me back my money, what you've taken with interest? No, the world has no longer any more claims over that dead man. No one can come and say, hey, wake up, man, repay us. Then you can go back to eternal death, okay, or whatever, okay. Now, if he has a court case against him, okay, no one can come and tell him, hey, wake up, come attend your court case. It's all over. Being buried signifies what? Complete transition. You're released from the old life. You're completely free from the old life. And the old man has no longer any claim over your lives. I think that is a truth which most of us have to be resurrected into and live into. Some of us are constantly living with the things that have happened in the past. And it's hurting, it's painful. But 
when you when you're running your race you remember right if you're if you look back the speed is cut you lose the speed it's like a break and you can't catch up with that speed that you're um, running right i remember when i was in a bible college um, uh, we used to have a sports day for our uh, uh, you know for all, we had all students single students married with their children all the faculty all the staff everybody staying on the campus um, so huge big community in itself so we had sports day and i got uh, selected for the 100 meters race i was the only student running and all of the other uh, uh, who uh, you know uh, qualified for the 100 meters women's dash were all the faculty children you know some of them i was teaching them in the in the in the children's church so it was quite embarrassing and one girl was very tall and well built and uh, she was a champion in her school in 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 athletics and then i in my mind i had already decided that she is going to be first and i'm going to be last and all of these children are going to un outrun me and i'm going to be such a make a fool of myself because i'm the only student running qualified to run with these uh, children and then the 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 90 100 meters dash the 90 meters i was running coming first you know what i did in the 90 meter uh, point i suddenly thought hey i can't be first it must be a foul start it must be a foul fall start i am the only one running and i just stopped and I, I mean didn't stop i mean i broke my speed and looked back and i that girl jamaima she ran past me and just in like just a little meter she the re, uh, you know she she came first and everybody started shouting at me remember all the student body even though they were not in my group What's wrong with you? Don't you know you shouldn't look back and all of these things? I didn't tell anybody what was playing in my mind. But that's what happens even in the race of life, right? We are constantly looking back and we can't walk ahead into the things that God has for us. We're constantly living in the past failures, past broken relationships, past things that have happened. But God is saying, hey, move on. I have something much more greater, bigger best for you okay walk into that okay so um so paul is saying that when christ was buried we were buried with him old life has no claims and he says when we are raised from the dead just like christ we can also walk in newness of life okay so resurrection means what walking in the newness of life in the new nature that becomes Christ's nature becomes our nature in the new covenant blessings the promises everything that christ has in store for us no longer living as slaves but living as sons and daughters with that authority using that authority speaking in that authority so he says we were uh, so what does crucifixion mean how do we spiritually ad identify with christ's uh, crucifixion that means the end of the old man the power of sin is broken sin has no longer any power over our lives we are no longer slaves to sin what is how do we identify with christ's burial spiritually the end of the old life the old life has no longer claim on our selves okay and what does how do we identify spiritually with christ's resurrection we are given a brand new life we have the eternal life the zoe life the god kind of life how does how do we identify spiritually with christ's ascension we are no longer under the influence of the systems of this world the evil the corruption the moral degradation we are above that we can speak to that and we can um, overcome this the system of evil and rebellion and how do we identify spiritually with seated with Jesus Christ? We all operate out of a place of dominion and authorities over everything that uh, influences us, that oppresses us, depresses us, subjects us to various things. We have author authority and dominion. Okay. And the, oh, so we'll have to stop here. <laughs> I'm just going to start. Okay. Any questions? Any questions anyone has?
Um, online students, any questions you all have? You all are very quiet. Any questions? Uh, are you able to hear me? Yes, very clearly, Nina. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Uh, we had referred to an efficient passage also, Ephesians 2, where mm -hmm. it refers to us saying that we are seated with Christ in the heavenly places. So that would mean, I think one of the things that you mentioned was that, so the spirit man is what is seated in the heavenly places. Do we say it that way? It's because the other thing, I mean, the, the, uh, the soul, which I mean, our mind has to keep being renewed and uh, things like that. So like that, we can say we are spiritually, we are in that place. But then we have to work uh, on the soul and the body aspect. Of course, body will have to go in accordance to what it receives in the mind from the spirit. But is that what it is? is I just wanted to clarify that. So yes, the uh, you know, our spirit man is born again. Uh, when we accept the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's in our spirit man that we receive things from God because God is spirit. So we receive uh, from the, uh, you know, the spiritual realm, we, rece we, we receive things in the natural realm from the uh, spiritual realm. Okay. So when our spirit is born again, our spirit man, our spirit man is in tune with God's spirit. We hear from him. And, you know, um, uh, you know, just like our spirit man has the five sense uh, senses and, you know, um, uh, these senses, what we receive from the spiritual realm is actually uh, processed in our minds. And what is processed in our minds is acted out in our body. So our minds are the uh, processors. So that is why we need to uh, renew our minds. And when our minds are renewed and receiving the things of the spiritual things from the spirit realm, you know, and our minds are also renewed, then our actions are also in line uh, with what our spirit man is agreeing and what God is asking us to do. But when you're talking about being seated um, uh, with on the right hand of the Father, it's talking about it in a spiritual sense, not like in the physical sense, but in the spiritual uh, sense. That is our identification. That is the truth of our identification spiritually. So what does it uh, basically mean that, you know, uh, that we are seated with Christ, that we operate out of a place of dominion and authority on this earth. So everything on this earth, it, 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 the realm of the influence that we have, we operate not with, uh, you know, what we, uh, the authority that we receive from the world, but what we receive from uh, Christ, we, we operate out of the kingdom authority, the kingdom power that is vested in us. And the kingdom of God is in us. Again, that is also the spiritual dimension that we are living. The spiritual aspect of the kingdom of God we're living now is the spiritual dimension. Later on will come the literal physical kingdom when Jesus comes to rule the thousand year period. I hope that helped. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Uh, have a blessed day. God bless. Thank you.